hubs. Creative hubs can be both hubs on online internet that is actually not a physical space. It can just be a, a creative social space in, in on internet. It could also be a physical space like today. Today we're having a creative hub here in DLD, people meeting, um, that is a non-permanent hub, and we have permanent hubs. And people can also be, of course, creative without being part of a hub. And so let me start with that. I'm from Norway. There's a, a guy in Norway called uh, DVD John. He cracked the DVD uh, in the late 90s. He came from a small town called Lardal. And Lardal is known for having about 600 sheep, uh, five cows, and two houses. This is absolute nowhere. And from this, this nowhere place, he did some of the most creative work in terms of hacking, uh, at least of the period. Um, so my, my question, the initial question to you is, do we really need a hub in order to be creative? 100% um, you need a hub. Um, I believe from the perspective of a, a, a startup, of an entrepreneur, you need an environment um, uh, which inspires you. And um, um, Nowadays, it's not a competition between um, countries, it's a competition about innovation hubs, what they offer, from uh, uh, what kind of services they have, what kind of people they are living and working there. And I think to, to, um, to do new things, you need people. It's a people business, and people want to live and to work in, in a... Um, in a um, environmental, where um, they have uh, a challenge. So when I um, look at Berlin, um, we have um, people from 180 different nations. It's a clash of culture. They have a, a different background, a different um, education. And, um, um, and uh, together, um, because, um, it's a, a unique point. It's like uh, New York. It's like other big uh, hubs. And this is what the people want to prefer. There are one, one out of 100 make in, uh, their business in the rural area. Yeah, OK. But uh, the most uh, startups um, want, to, want to talk to each other and want to um, um, get experience from established companies. That's why. Um, Berlin is so attractive because there are a lot of corporates which are coming in the city. I'd also like to say, I mean, I'm a bricks and mortar gal, but I'll say that in New York City, what's happened, you know, the days of working at home and being in your slippers, it didn't turn out to be, at least in, in many industries, what people thought because people crave interaction and they crave collisions and both, you know, planned and unplanned collisions. And it is in many ways why more than ever in the history of the world, people are living in cities. In a digital economy, in innovation economy, I think there's a reason why people are flocking to cities because it is the diversity of thought, it's intellectual capital, it's an environment where you are encouraged to push the envelope, to challenge, and then you have an environment where it has to be affordable and reasonable in terms of the, the ability for you to do that. And I think that's why it's incumbent upon cities to create those petri dishes of opportunity for all of that to take place. It needs to be organic. I don't think it can be heavily curated, but when you have a great city with a lot of diversity and a collision of lots of ideas, you have the makings of a hub. And I think New York City is unto itself a hub. And then within this hub, there are many, many, many other different types of hubs. Uh, if you happen to live in a farming village in Norway, it's awesome to have the internet. And I learned about DVD John because of the internet. I think that was in the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah, I was at Wired at the time. Uh, and it was great to be able to reach out via the internet and connect with him and try to get him to write something for the magazine. Um, so it's awesome that you have that connectivity and that people can connect and create community, but there really is nothing better than physicality. Um, and that, I think this is sort of the great uh, story of our day. Um, we tried out this whole uh, industrialized suburban uh, approach to the to how we, you know, cohabitate, and I don't think the suburbs are going anywhere. Actually, I think the suburbs are urbanizing, um, and and we're no longer seeing just sort of cities and suburbs. We're seeing metropolis 
and the metropolis includes the suburbs and any good suburb now has hubs. Um, and you know, I grew up in a suburb called Pasadena, which is outside of Los Angeles, and it was pretty sleepy. Uh, but go back there now, and there's co-working spaces, and there's a really hot kind of music scene, and there's cafes, and um, people crave a place to be creative, and you just, it's super hard to do that without rubbing into other people. It kind of leads me to a, to a new question. You talk about a place. Um, so what is a place? And, you know, as a real estate developer, you, of course, think about a place as something physical. Um, but lots of people, they think about a place as a place that is virtual. Um, a chat room, uh, a place where you meet people with other type of intellectual capacities or interested in a certain topic. And, and your creative hub uh, really happens in the virtual space more see, than I don't, the I don't space. necessarily see that. I, I think this co-working phenomenon is really quite fascinating because many people um, argued it would never work. And they argued it was a passing, fading kind of a thing and that it would be hot for a period of time and then not. And I think if you think about just what's happening with a company like WeWork, it really is, um, I think, represent representative of people's need to be with other people. And there can be virtual experiences as well, but I, I really do believe that this, this idea of community, and it's a word that's tossed around a lot, but it, it's reflective in the fact that the, one of the largest consumers of space in this city right now are co-working firms. And then people say that when the economy turns, they'll be the first to go. I don't believe that because this untethered existence where you're paying a monthly subscription and you can stay for as long as you like and go if you need to, you're not, you know, you're not signing leases, you're not bogging yourselves down with long-term commitments. It's, it's kind of a post-recession mentality where in a city like New York where people rent more than they buy, the idea that you can up and go and you can be footloose and fancy free and you can create all of your own interactions on your terms, I think is why the co-working phenomenon is working, not just here, but you go any great city around the world and you'll see that happening. I, I think the one thing we have to keep in mind Virtual is about 10% of what you actually get when you're communicating with another human being. You get 90% of your communication non-verbally. Uh, and it's really hard to get that non-verbal in a chat room or, uh, you, know, you know, even in, I don't know how many of you guys use Google Hangouts or Skype, it's been a revolution and it's, it saved me a number of flights. But at the end of the day, if you're not in the same room, you're losing a lot of your bandwidth in terms of the connections that you're making with other human beings. Now, this may change, and it may be changing in the next five to ten years, and I think that, you know, there's a reason that, um, you know, Zuck bought Oculus, <laughs> um, and that, that Google and, and everyone else is paying so much attention to AR, mixed, uh, mixed reality, and, and VR. I do think that it's coming to the point where we're going to be able to express ourselves at a pretty high bandwidth across digital channels. That will be very interesting, um, but I think it will actually create a higher premium on physicality. Um, and so I, I, if I were in investing, I'd invest in a counter indicative to that because I think it's going to be actually more important to get together physically. It's going to be more valuable and it's going to be, the you know, you're going to be like really selective about how you spend your physical time if you spend a lot of time in VR or AR. Um, I totally agree. Um, I think the um, digital things, like you mentioned, uh, Skype or so, is very necessary to, to do your own international business because um, you, you um, need not so much uh, time to set up a Skype conference when you go from uh, Berlin to New York for a, a five-minute uh, meeting. But at the end, it's a people business. And the DLD, or um, another example, is uh, the industrial exhibition last week in, in um, Germany. Um, the President Obama was there uh, with 400 um, US enterprise, enterprises. And um, they can offer their products and their services via our internet, yeah? and, and they do it in a really good uh, way. But at the end, they want to show um, what, what for people and employers are behind um, 
the, the startups uh, behind the um, work and behind the products. And uh, that's why um, I think the success of uh, WeWork, for example, um, is a hint that uh, people want to, to meet and to talk and uh, a trend uh, or a new project from WeWork, We Living, I think it's uh, in, in New York a project, I don't know really the status quo, is uh, a symbol that um, um, the, the hubs and the cities and the real estate uh, guys have to offer um, an atmosphere and, and locations to meet and to talk and to do their business. And let's talk about the business reality, which is if you're in a business of ideas, the idea of, um, of connective media, of ad tech, and even fintech in New York, it's so fundamental that if you are um, uh, trying to promote or launch or invent um, the access to this type of, um, of intellectual capital, the dollars, um, and, um, and, and the ideas are really in the great cities. And so um, New York really does offer a lot in those areas. And I think if you want to be in that space, you need to have some physical representation in that space. We just recently went um, to Israel and then to London um, launching this building that we call The Bridge. And we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and clearly uh, in Israel, it's less about draining the, 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 um, the intellectual capital out of Israel. It's more about once your, um, your technology, your widget um, is invented, you, know, you have to find the market and, and the, the business development plan to launch it. And uh, in many, many minds believe that type of moment occurs in a place like New York. And they, they want to break through and come to a city like New York. And I think in London, we found the very same thing. So there's a point in, in the life cycle of an idea or a company where you need to be um, in a diverse um, place where there are just a, a huge collision of ideas and access to capital to really launch um, your idea or your business. So, so I'm a historian, and I can't just notice how things have changed. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, people said place was not important. This is the old, uh, you worked in Wired magazine earlier, uh, and it was like, well, you can just work from home, you can work from your computer, maybe physical offices will not exist anymore, uh, the home office was your actual office, maybe companies can be, it doesn't really matter where they are located. Those were the ideas around doing the sort of first dot com dot gone uh, 15 years ago. Now what I'm hearing is that the physical space is key from all three of you. And that's a change in the way we debate uh, the hub, the idea of creative hub. Right? Wrong. Well, physical space with, without physical barriers, because in some ways there needs to be physical space, but we're seeing a transformation in the workplace. People aren't working the same way anymore, so there is a need for a place or a space, but the way that those spaces are being designed and built and operated are dramatically different um, than, than a decade ago. Yeah, well, I think one of the things we kind of fell in love with, with the sort of web 1.0, was the idea that you could, you know, work in a different context, right? And, and that context that was easiest to understand was the home or the home office or your, if you were a blogger, your pajamas, which really bothered me as a blogger because I didn't even own pajamas. But, um, but <clears throat> I think actually what we ended up doing is integrating work and life um, so that we now, I mean, if you look at WeWork, um, I don't know whether that's a workplace or a a college dorm, it's hard to tell, and, and actually that's the same for the Google campus. Um, and, and a lot of the buildings of the companies that, that we highlight at Nuco. Um, but uh, having gone to 12 different cities in the last nine months where we've had Nucos and gone into the offices of hundreds of different kinds of companies, what is remarkable to me is the consistency of the space in terms of its encouraging its employees to work the way that makes them most creative, which generally means allowing them to express themselves, which is used to be you could only really express yourself at home yeah. or with your friends out at, you know, when you're going out drinking or whatever. But at the office, you were like, you know, wore a suit and you could really express any individuality. That's, that's what's completely changed is that the workplace has been built to be an expression of the, hopefully the highest value of, of, of humanity. Um, and, and that's sort of like the Richard Florida work on the creative class and that kind of stuff. But that, 
I think that's the big shift. I would agree with that. That's a very interesting way to say it because I, I think that's in fact a big part of what's changed. And as real estate demand goes, we haven't seen a dramatic drop off in the actual need for space. And again, we're in cities where density is accepted and embraced and it allows us to do this um, live work concept, you know, what makes a great building today is the ability to live there, possibly work there, get know your barista down in the retail space. That's urban living now at its at its finest, so that you're not commuting and you're not going long distances for your for your groceries, and you know your friends are close by. So I think it also has implications for the way that we build um, in cities. Are there questions from the audience? Yes, I see a lady with a scarf. Uh, Hello. Uh, my name's Julia Hobsbawm. I'm over from London. I'm visiting professor in networking at the Cass Business School, and I study connectedness. I think it's just important to lay on the table formally that what we're describing is enhancing the ability to make relationships. We're not describing the architecture per se, although the architecture enhances that, but what I'm noticing is a trend in the desire, exactly as John was describing, for the sort of in-depth curated connection, and basically the word is intimacy. And we are all learning now to become individuals who work and individuals who have feelings, and that's why conferences like DLD work. That's why our conferences work. And so the challenge for people building these co-working spaces, which I have never yet seen, and I haven't seen it in gyms, and I haven't seen it in libraries, and I haven't seen it in members clubs, is how do you bring relationship enhancement into those workspaces in a way that isn't just hydroponic plants looking gorgeous? Because that, to me, is the challenge. It's got to do more than just look great. Thank you. And you would like to respond? Well, the best, I mean, look, <laughs> you can't force that, right? That's the hardest thing. How do you create strong relationships and a sense of community that sort of fosters even stronger relationships over time? Um, I, I found out last month when I was, ex we were, were going to go into China in, um, I think, in the fall. I mean, it's a different culture. They're like, yeah, we're, we'll stand up a festival. Don't worry about it. We'll do it in two months. I'm like, well, it takes six. No, don't worry. Uh, okay, you guys are the experts in China because you're Chinese. But what they told me when we were talking, because we, we use a partner model, uh, I was talking to the partner in China, and they said, um, the government is in investing over $200 billion, $275 billion into startups. They've figured out, they've decided that hubs and accelerators and incubators are the thing, and they're just going to overbuild it just like they did with cities but before, you know, and there's just a bunch of empty buildings and now there's going to be an empty, empty buildings with slogans on the wall and, and hydroponic plants. Um, that doesn't, it strikes me, that's not going to work. What you need is a network of people, right? And if you don't have one, it, it gets very difficult. Um, so encouraging that connection, I mean, I think that's, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is to put a keg in the middle of the room, uh, you know, really. Um, and, and that's what WeWork did. They, they put a free beer in the middle, and it turns out only 10 or 15% of people actually use it. But just the fact of the free beer allows people to have a conversation about that fact, and then the connection starts. So you have to, you know, it takes a certain kind of programmer to understand how to do that, and not everyone's good at it. And I think the real estate industry will be terrible at it. So I think it really is, if you look at Brooklyn, what happened in Brooklyn? Um, it was a place that, um, food, it was a food revolution bring people together over breaking bread. It was um, art and culture and affordable. And those are the pioneers that begin to set in motion placemaking in my view. And I think that is, the story of Brooklyn is really a story of creating an authentic place that wasn't curated by others on the outside, it happened. And, and I think that you need to try and create that same magic, that secret sauce, inside spaces. And what's interesting about the bridge is that we're not trying to do it inside one particular user space. We're trying to do it under this one roof where you have an unbelievable institution and you have a, a curated group of individuals and companies, but we're, it, has to, it has to happen on its own. The programming aspect related to the co-working space is really important because that's the connective tissue that if it's done properly will help foster all of this. But I think it's all about authenticity and not overdoing it and knowing what you know and what you don't know. 
Thanks. Stefan? Yeah, um, I think uh, I, I thought about a, a technology park in Berlin called Adlershof, where in the beginning, 20 years ago, it was a technology park only for uh, industry. And it didn't work so well. And when they decided to bring um, a university to the park uh, with young people, and they decided to, to um, establish a bar and a coffee and a little bit entertainment and sports, um, it, it, um, it uh, works. No, nowadays, they have 1,000 uh, technology-oriented um, enterprises there. And um, this is, this is uh, what the people need, a combination of um, culture, living, opportunities um, for working and opportunities uh, for the free time. Thank you so much. We are running out of time. I just want to say thank you to John, Stefan, and Marianne for coming. Appreciate it. I want to remind everyone that uh, upstairs, the, actually, we have those beer bottles and those coffee cups. You can go up there and feel creative and get to know each other. Um, and with that, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you.